Welcome to Funnel Reboot, the podcast that shares ideas on how to upgrade your lead generation. Here is your host, Glenn Schmelzley. Welcome to Funnel Reboot, where we explore how to upgrade our lead generation. We're going to talk about mistakes today. Uh, hang on. Today, we're going to talk about mistakes. Yes, they are so ingrained in our present day world, we even expect them depicting things said in the future. If you don't believe me, watch Star Trek. You'll know that any time they beam down on an away mission, something's going to go wrong, and usually someone wearing a red shirt won't last until the end of the episode. So beyond hearing Star Trek references in this show, you're going to hear about mistakes, some real doozies too. And you're going to hear about the roles that automation, documentation, and realistic deadlines and self-assessments all have in determining whether mistakes are going to happen in marketing. And you'll also hear how they can be avoided, but also why bending ourselves into pretzels, trying not to make them, is wrong. My guest is founder of Danger Co., a 360-degree marketing consulting and coaching practice. Right off the bat, you need to know that she isn't afraid to make mistakes. In fact, when you hear her last name in a moment, you'll see how aptly it describes her fearlessness and how she makes her opinions of marketing known. She went to school for youth and social work originally, but she's always had a flair for communications. Ever a believer in the power of the internet to share stories, she came into a personal life event that gave her a chance to build an audience off of her blog. And soon, the explosive success on social media and mainstream media of that project gave her the spark to enter marketing, which led her to sell her expertise to companies that she met through her personal project. And that led to working for a city councillor. And then she went out on her own as a marketing consultant and has consulted to tech firms ranging from startups to ones going through successive investment rounds. In addition to her consultancy, she's an artist, a writer, an advisor at a local business accelerator. She's a recipient of the Ottawa 40 Under 40. She's a part-time professor at Algonquin College, and she's someone who's really enthusiastic about youth wellness and animals and nature. It's time to hear from our guest, Jordan Danger. How's it going, Jordan? It's going great. Thanks so much. And I'm so excited to be here. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Today, we're talking about marketing mistakes. And I do want to spend a fair bit of time uh, delving into just the horrible blunders that we've seen. But in all seriousness, we are aiming to prevent them, right? So this is something that we're, we're really trying to deconstruct how mistakes happen and hopefully stop them before they ever do. Exactly. Yeah. So maybe I know one of the things I have a difficulty with is even knowing where to start with this, because, you know, you've been around a time I've been around for a minute and we have seen, I'm sure between the both of us, a lifetime's worth of things that have gone wrong. Um, I'm interested in maybe starting by asking about the size of companies that uh, tend to really, you know, put their foot in it. Um I've had the good fortune of, in my career, I kind of started off in corporate and then moved into successively smaller companies. Uh, and I'm wondering if you think that the smaller you go in the company, the, the ones that are, you know, at that stage where you've got people who maybe are just trying to carry marketing, even though they don't have a professional or an academic marketing background. I mean, do you think that size of company is related to when a uh, most problems are going to happen or does it look different to you? Well, it depends on the company. I mean, some companies are built to be small um, pretty much permanently. Um, so, you know, I think that's kind of overlooked a lot when we talk about marketing is that some businesses are meant to, for example, support, you know, five, 10, eight staff uh, yep. indefinitely. And that's great. And their marketing needs would be different. But, um, you know, usually when we ask these questions, we're talking about things more like a startup or something that's looking to scale. And in my experience, it's usually as a business leaves the early stage and moves in, into like mid stage or traction level of growth, where you kind of go from under 20 staff members to 
30, 50, start to get up there, um, maybe even up to 100. Uh, you're going through Series A, perhaps funding or something equivalent if you're not going that route. And um, the team is growing quickly. Uh, and it's really moving from the kind of growth where you can do it uh, exponentially. You can do change and growth exponentially when you're small. You can change your mind overnight. You can change the entire color of the product, whatever you want to do. And it only really affects a small number of people and, and their workflow. And then as you start to expand into um, having bigger costs and bigger teams uh, and more diverse needs, it's harder to turn that ship around overnight, right? And that's usually where I start to see um, some growing pains happening around marketing because it would, used to be easy to just change your mind overnight or change a whole campaign overnight. And now it's, now it's uh, a bigger shift to turn. Yeah, you've got that left hand, right hand thing going, right? Yeah, and I think also there's a really like a, a lack of appreciation for the difference a degree can make when you're small or large. And I think of it, you know, I, I shoot archery. So it, it always makes me think, you know, if I'm really close to the target and I'm slightly off center, it's not going to be that bad once I actually hit the target. But if I'm standing 200 yards back, even a slight difference makes a huge difference, right? So yes. um, that same effect can happen in business. And so the larger the team, it's kind of like the further back you are from the target. Uh, yeah, I very much agree with that. Um, I wonder if you think that that's one of the issues with marketing mistakes is maybe when you're huddled around a table and you're just getting those plans pulled together, it may not seem like it's much of a problem. That would be like just standing right in front of the target for you. But if you're trying to do something that's going to have like a brand and it's got to have a life, you know, a half year from now, a year from now, three years from now, that's like standing well back mm -hmm. from, from the target and those degrees of, you know, variation that you have uh that and just the fact that nobody's got a crystal ball makes it really hard for us to say in the here and now yeah this is going to work a few years from now because there can be a lot of things that you know change and it won't it won't work yes and as well when companies are moving from uh their customers being a, a you know a smaller group of early ad adopters or innovators into the more cautious purchasers, uh, you know, we can have a lot of early stage success and say, well, people love it when we just do weird campaigns that have, you know, nothing to do with the actual product, or we, they love it when we tell them to sign up for newsletters and a secret surprise launch will happen or, you know, other sort of, um, I don't know, guerrilla marketing kind of fun stuff, which I love to do. Yep. Uh, yeah. But it's not the same when you're trying to get the later adopters to, um, to kind of buy into your product, right? Yeah, they may be more mainstream in their tastes. Exactly. Uh, can, can you think of any specific uh, things that were tried and, you know, look back later and they were just acknowledged as a just just a flop? I mean, dead on arrival. I remember one, for example, I had a uh, I was in a rather large marketing team and the VP stood up and said, I think we need to send out a large mailing and you know, I'm dating myself a little bit, but, you know, it was when that wasn't a crazy idea and it was five figures uh, in terms of audience. It was, you know, tens of thousands of people. They rented a list. OK, that I have to say that right up front. And we had great anticipation in the build up to this and had, you know, people arranged to receive the response that we expected to flood in crickets. And not only crickets, but that VP never even brought it up again in a meeting, you know? So that's one of the things that I see as a problem is that we will sometimes make these mistakes and then it's like we make them even worse by how we react to them. Yeah, people have a, a tendency, definitely, you know, we run a loss aversion path and we're afraid to admit that something's not working. Um, I see that happen a lot with businesses when there's a real strong belief that their industry should succeed in a certain type of marketing. And so, you know, this happens pretty often where people get um, kind of wrapped up in the what we're doing instead of why we're doing it. Um, the number of clients, I don't get this as much as I used to, but I used to get a lot of people calling up and saying, hi, we need, we need 50,000 Facebook followers. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, why? <laughs> why do you think you need that? Um, so, you know, when I see teams that say, well, we're a SaaS product, so we should be uh, doing a ton of pay-per-click and people should be transactional right on the site. Um, 
you know, but without looking at the entire business and why that only worked for a certain select group at the start and why the later adopters need more support, uh, more access to, you know, look and feel in touch of the product before they buy, um, you know, those mistakes can be costly. And especially if you've kind of gotten your head, no, SaaS is sold through pay-per-click. We're going to just keep going at this. Yeah. So like you've hit on one thing there and I didn't want to just gloss over what you'd said earlier about, you know, having a professional marketer, maybe one that has a degree, uh, like that would seem to be we're racing towards a tactic in a completely uh, strategic vacuum. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and that it's, it's good. It sounds like you've been the person who's turned back to them and said, okay, what's your strategy that you're trying to reach in, in getting that, you know, pay-per-click campaign or those Facebook followers? Yeah. I'd say in the last 10 years, marketing, maybe even 15 marketing has gone through quite a shift in terms of, um, you know, at least from, okay, so when you're not a marketer, 15 years ago, your perception of marketing was probably something like from uh, Mad Men, right? Yep. Uh, and uh, and that's kind of like your whole scope of it. And then about 15, 10 years ago, um, we started to have a real rush of social media and it then it became monetized and, and advertised upon. Um, and when we went through that, people got excited about tools in marketing even people who didn't have anything to do with marketing got excited about tools. I had people who barely knew how to check their email or didn't know how to use their smartphone who were asking me when they were going to get a Hootsuite account and they don't even know what that is. Uh, yeah. So they're just excited about the idea of tools, which is kind of cool. But at the same time, it meant that there was a lot of decisions made around tactical. So, you know, we're going to, we're going to hire someone to run ad campaigns, someone to run pay-per-click, someone to run AdWords, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, great. Did you have anyone look at your brand and your content? No. So you have, Ads right. that maybe are running great, but they're sending people to a website that was built by someone from the dev team on a weekend and it has no ability to convert, right? Yeah. So it's great that you're it's great that you're so excited about Google AdWords or whatever, but it's uh it's not gonna actually work for you if you don't fix the back end of the strategic, you know, actually thinking about how a customer buys and what it entices them and what how important a brand is. Yeah. And I mean, uh, let's talk about I guess the other elephant in the room, which is uh, the cost of having that person who can look all the way up, uh, you know, from management, but who can also look all the way over to that guy in dev and say, all right, I'm responsible for looking at what the customer's experience of us is. And, you know, I'm calling BS on this. There is a problem. We should, you know, abort this launch before we really make a a, a fool of ourselves. Uh, and yet that person is usually one of the lowest budgeted positions and the company is hoping that they can sh shave a corner off of uh, what they're doing by, you know, either getting somebody who's uh, even an intern or someone who is coming on the cheap uh, into that position. What, what do you think of, you know, how much that plays a role in making mistakes? Well, I see that happen a lot. Um, so typically in a, you know, most of the startups I get to spend time with, uh, I find that, um, I mean, and this makes sense, but the first place where you're going to pour fuel on the fire is going to be your, your product, whether that's a physical product, a SaaS product, it doesn't really matter. Uh, yeah. And then you're going to be taking that to market. And those, you know, those innovators or early adopters are going to show you that they like it and that they're okay with beta versions or, you know, slightly funny versions or whatever. Um, and you start to gain some interest and traction in the community and, you know, it goes from there. So uh, at that point, you probably need to add to maybe your operations team or maybe your customer service team. And so often it would typically work out that the marketing team is one of the last ones to kind of get any fuel for its fire. So there's usually a ramp up period that's uh, that can be a growing pain or awkward. Um, by the time marketing comes in, it's not uncommon for some of the other teams to have sort of siloed a little bit. Um, you know, you're starting to have some of the growing pains of different departments having different pro uh, priorities at the same time. And yeah. so marketing can come in and can feel like a bit of an interloper because a, a really effective marketing person or team uh, will come in and kind of get all up in your business. Like they're kind of like a raccoon in a campsite, right? So they're, they're going yep. into CS, they're going into product, they're asking questions they're And, the, and because their job is to represent uh, the end user or the customer in a lot of ways, we're asking uncomfortable questions like, okay, but why are we spending six months building that feature? But I like this feature. 
And I think the customers like this feature. Let's focus on this one first. So um, we can kind of <laughs> be very much yeah. like raccoons on a campsite in that uh, we can be a, a bit of a pest at first. So um, during that time, it can be difficult for marketing to find its footing and find a ground that um, where people are, are open and welcoming and excited about marketing. And I think it's important to find ways to listen first and see um, if there's places for what I call like easy wins. Um, you know, if, yeah. for example, if, if products just been waiting for a really clear brand guide, like let's make that happen, you know, uh, yeah. give them something they need right away. And it's easier then to, when you can show that you understand their needs in their department, then you can then make some requests of your own. Yes. Now I'm going to put you on the spot here because I'm sure that, uh, out of the people who are listening to this, there are some who can look around, you know, looking at it inside of from their shoes and they see easy wins. Maybe there's only a few things wrong, but I can also imagine that if they got on with a company, there are cases where that company is actually fundamentally flawed in how they're building things. Maybe the, uh, management in the company, just, they don't, as I describe it, they don't have a marketing bone in their body uh, <laughs> and they're not interested in listening. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause that it has to be a two way talk. So, like what career advice do you give when that person, usually the lone marketer in the company, or if they're just getting started, there's maybe two or three, but they're not so sure of their own voice that they can say, okay, this is beyond, you know, I really don't know what I can do here. Do you have any advice for how someone might know whether they're in a situation that's fixable or if they're in a place where it's going to be mistakes from here till doomsday? That's a great question. I've been in that spot. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe more than not. Um, but, uh, you know, that makes me think of uh, when I used to work, I used to work for a city councillor, uh, okay. a, commu a communications and marketing person. And uh, it was an office that had been strongly advised that they needed to get on board with digital communications, um, social media, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, they brought me in. And initially there was uh, a real, it was almost like a fear. Like I was a weird wizard that had come in and they didn't understand what I would be doing, but they knew that I would have instant access to the public. And that was very scary. Yeah. Um, and there was also a strong belief that the old ways worked just fine. And there was no need, for example, to say, you know, develop uh, a logo for the counselor because they used mint green paper when they sent out newsletters. And that was their concept of branding. <sighs> Stuff like that. So, um, so that was one where I thought, what have I gotten myself into here? Uh, and what I learned from that was there was a lot I could learn and do, uh, on projects that would show success, uh, that may not feel like immense successes, uh, to me or like the speed I wanted to go, but right. it was still a ton of learning. So, you know, that's one of the best places I learned to deal with uh, some of the, you know, that, that slow ship we were talking about. There's a lot of bureaucracy and difficulty yes. turning the, the boat around there. Um, yes. And also to recognize that my concept of success is different than the people I work with or for sometimes. So, for example, right. we, we hosted a uh, thing called the um, annual town hall meeting. Every councillor holds one of these. You All of your councillors have these. You probably don't go. Um, and so a typical audience showing up for those at the time was about eight people. Okay. And we would send out a, um, a big sort of print version of all the information as well. So, uh, what we did this time round, uh, was I said, listen, I'm really sure that if we stream this, that it's going to have a lot more tenants. So, uh, you know, it was kind of one of these like, okay, we're going to give you the money to do this. But uh, it better work out or we're kind of we're going to prove that social media doesn't matter to constituents. Ah, and yep. so uh, we put on we put on the event. I was so nervous. We did a ton of marketing over social media and we had a blockbuster turnout of 15 people. And I thought, well, that's it. I'm fired. Uh, and on these uh, with the live feed, we had 300 people watching. And again, I thought, well, it's been a nice run. <laughs> <laughs> But the next day, uh, the city councilor came into the office and he just pointed at me and he went, 300 people. And I was like, I know. And he's like, that's amazing. And for about two <laughs> weeks, right. every time he walked by, he's like, hey, 300. Like, that was his thing. So, yeah. uh, you know, to me, that was like, oh, God, what am I doing here? Uh, but to them, that was groundbreaking. Yes, yes. And so, yeah, your view of the goalposts and their view of the goalposts are different. Exactly. And, you know, um, and I still learned, like, 
I, in that time I learned how to do, um, to, to, do, to do live streaming like that. Right. Um, yep. I learned how to, to run stuff through a number of different departments in terms of, you know, some, some stuff like our blog, I was able to do independently, but other stuff, if it had anything to do with the media, you know, and, uh, I had people I had to go through in the media department. And I also got to spend time with people who were decades beyond me in terms of experience in PR. Uh, and they were, and I was really humble. I said, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't want to screw this up. Please help. And they would give me all sorts of advice. So, you know, it's kind of take what you can, uh, take what you can from the experience, give what you can at the experience. Yeah. And I'm, tell me about if you think, uh, this is a, a one way also to look at it, um, especially because it sounded like that was an environment where the the DNA of the place didn't lend itself uh, at all to marketing is sometimes I guess you have to resign yourself to the fact that doing some form of marketing that's going to move them forward is better than nothing because you could have in those cases shut your mouth you know not bother, bothered with the streaming not bothered with the mass emails but you know you you gave it a go and you found out how to move the levers inside of the big machinery to get something done mm -hmm. uh would you would you say sometimes that we've got to make our ourselves uh aware that mistakes are a natural part of the process and that we you know, really still want to achieve something, even if it means the odd mistake? I mean, yes, I think mistakes are really important. I think every marketer should be focused on mistakes daily. We should be looking for other people's. We should be paying attention. We should be watching the fallout. I want to watch Rome burn. And it's not because I, I have a ton of schadenfreude happening. I really want right. to understand how mistakes happen and what happens as they unravel as well. So make mistakes, watch mistakes. Don't be afraid of mistakes. Um, I will say like when you're looking, let's say you've entered a, a team, you know, you kind of got excited, you, you get in or, or, you know, a, a new business, even if you're the only marketer and you yep. look around and you go, okay. So for example, they want to do pay-per-click. Let's say they want to spend, I don't know, 10 grand a month on this, but they will not let me build a website. And it's, this one's built on Wix by the neighbor. Right. And you just go, okay, no, this is never going to work. So it's okay to know that there's a, a finite period uh, or a finite kind of run that you can do. You have to make a choice then around what you're going to do. And my goal is always try and leave things better than I than I found them coming in. Um, and I'm realistic and I try and be really direct and explain as best I can uh, to non-marketers, which is usually who I'm working for, why, yes. you know, I can get you somewhere, but you have to give me something. So, you know, you have to give me the ability to at least myself build you a semi-okay website um, or whatever the the sort of bottleneck is. So, you know, there's things where we go, well, I really would have loved to have done, you know, really cool videos for that city council, or I would have liked to have done ABC. But, um, you know, if it's about you wanting to do stuff, or you're kind of running through a playbook, I get that. At the same time, you're going to know that there's certain things that are essential. And if you can't get those essential things, then you're in a bigger, you're in a bigger fire. Yeah. And I mean, you've highlighted, they may not necessarily know exactly what they want. They are giving you their best, best formed picture of what the future is. But you do have that opportunity. And I think it's a pretty small window at the beginning where you can ask why, 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 and try to uncover, uh, you know, maybe they just had the neighbor build that Wix website because they didn't know where else to go or they thought it would be monstrously expensive. And if you turn to them and said, yeah, but for a modest investment, I can get you something that's much better, which will actually achieve the objective. You might find that that's not a hard and fast constraint they've put there. That's just what they had at the moment. Right. So do you, do you agree that there are like a lot of moving pieces on the board and that it's really up to us to vocalize and try and find out which pieces we must use and which pieces we can, you know, maybe swap, swap in or out? Yeah. And I think the most successful marketers I know are ones that know how to explain things to people who either A, aren't marketers or B, don't care about how you feel about marketing or what your metrics are or what you're worried about. They want to know what's going to happen in like how that's going to impact their day. Uh, and that's not a negative. When you're running fast in a business, you don't have time to worry about how you know, the marketer really wants HubSpot and she's very upset. She doesn't have it. Like, right, what does that right. mean to me? Uh, but if I can say, yeah, you know how when you send emails out, you're always wondering who opened them? 
well, you know, I can help you do that if we get this program. So, yeah. you know, making sure you explain things so they understand the value it brings. Yeah. So let's talk about one other area uh, that, you know, will happen even if you do have management that's on board. And that is those whoopsies that we marketers do ourselves, maybe because we're running fast. Um, I'm thinking in particular of automation. I'm thinking of uh, large emails that go out. Uh, automation and, you know, use of tools that have so many smart settings in them now and the fact that they integrate too many other systems. Um, wow, when you make a mistake, you can really make it on a colossal scale. Uh, you know, have you seen any of that? Um, I'm asking for a friend. <laughs> and if you if you have, like, what what do you do the next morning? What do you... How how do you, as the marketer, how do you recover from a mistake like that? That's a good question. Um, you know, I th it it will depend a bit on the culture that you're in, dep depending on where you're embedded. Whether you're a contractor or you're a member of a marketing team or the only marketer, the people around you um, will obviously have some final say on the level of mistake that they're going to be okay with. And some places are yes. very very uh risk averse exactly and some places are more open and understanding um you know if you're in a position to be the leader of your team i strongly recommend that you uh you grow you foster a marketing team that's comfortable with error um you know the last team where i was embedded and i got to spend time uh leading a, a team uh we actually uh, started a thing called the fail whale. So I went out and got a stuffed whale and we put him on a gold pedestal. And nice. uh, every Friday we'd say, okay, who screwed up the worst this week? And we would <laughs> talk about that. And then whoever screwed up had to put it on their desk, but it wasn't had to in a negative. People would come by and go, oh, it's on your desk. What'd you do? And other teams would be like, what'd you do this week? And we'd be like, oh yeah, I sent out an email and I sent it out twice to the same people. Yeah, and like yeah. a 5, or, or it went to hello first name. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, um, you know, and that meant that we could talk openly about the mistakes, how they happen. Um, and, uh, I find that the more, the more that you tense up about the fact you're going to make a mistake, the more you're likely to make one. Yep. Uh, so, you know, finding a uh, balance there. Now, I mean, that being said, write a checklist and stick it on your computer screen. Check first name, last name, check this, check that. You know what I mean? Like, yes. there's no excuse for that kind of stuff. Uh, get Grammarly if you don't do well with uh, your grammar. Yep. You don't do well with your grammar right there. Um, you know, that's a thing. I, we had a we had a time uh, a little while ago where we printed a very expensive booth with a spelling mistake. Nobody noticed it for three days. Uh, oh. but, uh, then we had to get it reprinted. Uh, oh. so it was an important lesson. Definitely yeah. will. Um, so, you know, things like this happen, but uh, it's, if, if the mistake becomes repetitive, then you know you've got a spot. I'm going to say weakness. I don't mean in a bad way. We've all got weaknesses. I'm terrible at math. So if I know that, then I'll have someone check my numbers before I give a report at the quarterly review, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah that's, that's only smart. And that minute that you take to document it, uh, if that becomes part of, you know, the standard process that you guys follow, uh, it's just, it gives you such peace of mind to know, okay, well, we won't make that mistake, right? It doesn't <laughs> rule out, it doesn't rule out Murphy's law from happening, but it'll at least keep you from committing those blunders. Like you said, that, uh, you know, you've done before and those ones hurt the most. Yeah. And it's tricky, right? I think people sometimes think, oh, you, uh, if you make a mistake on a newsletter at this job, you'll never make a mistake on the next newsletter, et cetera. Or, you know, you made a video and uh, you put it up on YouTube and you forgot to put in, you know, the CTA or whatever, and you're never going to do that again. But, right. you know, there's a couple things here. One is each company is different. Each platform they use is, or not every platform, but often the platforms change. And also when you're talking about things like social media, the platforms themselves can change overnight and you have no notice. So, um, you know, mistakes will happen that seem from the outside could seem like they keep happening or they've happened more than once. Um, sometimes those are, you know, I, every time I upload something to, to Facebook, I'm, I'm double checking buttons because I never know what they've changed. I'm not good. I'm not good at those tests where they show a picture twice and there's changes in the picture and that's yes. Facebook. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, you're making me think of, and it must've been a marketer who designed that little GIF that they put inside of MailChimp. I don't know if it still does it, but it was before you send out an email, it takes you to one final screen and there's a GIF of like a sweating hand yes. poised above the button, yeah. you know? And, and you're like, okay, are you absolutely positively sure? Uh, and, and yeah, there's a visceral 
feeling inside of us when we're doing these things. And if we use checklists that frankly are things that we can do at a time when we are composed, you know, let's, let's just remember that we're all human and we've all got, you know, neurochemicals that are going around. We got, you know, our adrenaline pumping. It's hard to think in those very moments, which is the exact moment where something like a documented process can just take the guesswork out of it and take the all the unnecessary butterflies out of the moment. It also makes you duplicatable. So I have a rule that everything I do, uh, everything I do in a in a career setting in any way has to be bus accident proof. So my rule is if I cross the street Good. tomorrow, I'm hit by a bus, could yep. someone else literally pick up what I do and do it? And if the system isn't built that way, I know that a, in the short term, it's it's shaky. And in the long term, it may not be scalable because if you can't write it down or describe it in a series of steps, it's probably not something you can sustain. OK, so you've just hit like this is the big call out of the entire podcast. I've decided <laughs> you just nailed the one thing. Um, so true. Um, I even on that no matter how humiliating it is, I will take that process that I've just written out and I will send it to somebody else and have them do it. And just as recently as yesterday, uh, I had somebody else do a process that I thought was bulletproof. They made a sizable error. Um, this was setting up an account and they set it up in a currency that we can't use. So I asked them why later and they were like, well, the template picture that you took the screen grab showed this currency so i use this currency which is not the currency that i wanted them to use mm -hmm. and you know like i had never seen that but that's the point of handing it to somebody else and while it's pretty morbid to think that you know it would be a bus accident that would require them to use it <laughs> i love i love your point that's just bang on yeah and also um you know i think especially too when things are the higher stakes a project is the more I find that my juniors uh, are afraid to think critically on their own. So, that, you know, your example is great, Glenn, because the idea that someone saw something and maybe their brain thought, well, shouldn't that be USD um, or shouldn't that be CAD and not USD? Um, yep. You know, yep. but then they go, oh, that's, this is a really big deal. It must be very like it's very specific. And so and actually, the more specific your instructions, the more likely it is people will assume that you didn't make any mistakes uh, and that you did want it exactly that way, even if it's a little bit weird or wrong or they're like, hmm, it doesn't seem right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. Running it through with uh, your teammates. And uh, if you're in a position to be handing off instructions to someone else, a peer, uh, someone who's working under you, whatever the case may be. I think it's so important to uh, let them know. I always say right off the bat, I think faster than I write. There's probably mistakes. It's okay to right. tell me. Don't yeah. think that I know everything. Yeah. If you know better than me, you know better than me. It may even be a good thing to say, and that's true, because when are you making that checklist? Probably 4.30 in the afternoon. You know, yeah. you're just interested in getting something done. Maybe you want somebody when they come in first thing in the morning to hit the ground with it. Uh, and it, it it's not bad even at the top of it just to say, you know, uh, there are some vaguenesses in here. Or if you, you know, think I've inferred something from this, just ping me because... You know, it may not be that the checklist is that specific. Exactly. I love that. Uh, do you do you think we also need to remember that sometimes we're asking somebody maybe to do something that's uh, over their head? And I think especially when it comes to managers talking to juniors. So we're in a you know scenario where we've got a couple of marketing people that sometimes we think they have skills that they don't have or maybe they're too confident in their own skills and they don't know where they could be taking a wrong step like do, do you how do, how do you handle that do you do you just throw something at them and see if they can nail it or do you try to size them up and say hmm, this might be a bit too much for them to t handle right now um you know i really try to when i have people that are working for me with me I try to make sure that I empower them to um, really learn to self-assess. It's It means that we sometimes make a few extra mistakes where I go, okay, I don't think you're ready, but you think you're ready. Uh, I mean, yeah. not on critical things, but small things. Yeah. And it might mean that I need to check. We might go through two drafts instead of one, say on you know visual copy for or visual content for an ad or something, because I want to see what they come up with on their own first. 
And in that way, I find I usually end up, people are, you know, more creative than I am and they have more brain capacity for projects than I do. That's why we have more than one head in the game. So I'm yeah. allowed to come up with something better if I stay out of the way and let them figure out for themselves where their limitations are and where their strengths are. That being said, um, you know, I think candid feedback is really important. I think it's really important for everyone to feel top and bottom, to feel like they can say, listen, I'm really good at this. I'm not good at this. I've had practice with this. I'm less good at this. Um, and if we can do that, then I find the juniors can also help the seniors. Um, yeah. But it is a problem, uh, especially because I find that a lot of companies, um, frankly, underspend on their marketing. So, you know, we talked about the idea of you're ramping up your business, you're moving out of early stage, you're into, you know, traction or, or middle stage growth, if you will, or even higher, but hopefully not higher. And you go, oh, we need marketing. And so you ask some people what they're spending and they say, oh, yeah, we have we have a marketer and, uh, you know, we spend X number a month on, uh, you know, other things. Okay, cool. And you try and start where they are. Well, yeah. the thing is, have they gotten there because they brought in someone like myself, a fractional CMO that comes in and gets the ball rolling and fix up the website and, and works with a bunch of contractors for a year. And now you're at a point where one person can maintain it, you know, or um, is your business exactly the same model, exactly the same price point? Like there's a lot of factors. So you know, often I see companies underspending um, on the staff uh, and or all of the, you know, spend that comes with marketing. And so we play this horrible game that, you know, anyone who's a designer knows this good, fast, cheap, you can only have two. Yep. Uh, and so when we go for cheap, then we often uh, lose the good or the fast. And so um, I find that's a real problem. And then what happens too is that when we're going for a less expensive marketer, they're often less experienced. Uh, and that means that they are often over their head. And uh, that's really not their fault. And they're going to do their best uh, and they're going to try really hard. But um, it's also not fair for people to think that they're going to have the same caliber of first run. They, they will over time possibly develop. Uh, yeah. But there's also a point where you're literally just not putting in enough water into the fire truck to put out the fire, right? So that's mm. thing that I see a lot. At the start of implementing your marketing program, you're going to have to spend more than you might say a year or two later, because you need to gain momentum and then you build something that you can maintain. But the initial part has experiments that cost money that lead nowhere. Uh, you know, there's, there's yes. sort of, or, or take <laughs> longer or take longer than management had hoped they would take to get mm -hmm. off the ground. Yep. Exactly. Well, and some projects are just expensive, um, time and money wise. Uh, you know, like if you're trying to fill in a blog that should have 50 posts by now and it's only got five, that's going to take right. time and it costs money. Uh, yep. and it feels kind of, you know, empty, but later, a year later, when you're ranking on the first page of Google, that feels good. <laughs> right. Then you're smiling. Yeah. yeah. No, you're quite right. And it takes uh, someone in, in your case, it sounds like you have to, uh, as a little bit of an outsider, um, step in and, you know, in that triangle between the junior marketer that the company's hired and senior management, you have to be the person. I, I've sometimes for my agency have to be the person who says to them, yeah, there's, you know, a very big fire raging and you brought a very small truck to try and put it out. Uh, there, sometimes it's just impressing upon them that being able to work with the clients that you have, maybe in the sales cycle that those clients like to make a decision in, you can't rush that. There's, you know, if you're going to try to put things out there and then validate that they work, that's really not on the company's timetable. It doesn't matter how many PowerPoint slides they've put up, you know, to mm -hmm. say, well, by this quarter, this is going to happen. Uh, you know, as I heard Eric Reese say it once, I can never forget it. You know, he said, yeah, just remember the person standing up there was sitting in front of a spreadsheet and they were making complete guesses when they put that table together, but they just wanted to get something there. And I think that that's good. Let's just remember though, it's a construct. It's a, it's a vision of a future to be that we want to see happen, but just because we wrote it there doesn't make it so. And these things will have to actually come out in the real world. This is frankly one of the things that I think non-marketers find the hardest to grasp about marketing. Yeah. And I think actually you're on something there because the there's like a double-edged sword with the fact that there's 
metrics now that we can track for marketing successes or the return on investment, yeah. right? So yeah. on the plus side, if I'm trying to make a case for why we, for example, like uh, why we want to have a LinkedIn account um, and do ads on LinkedIn, let's say. I can show with numbers and then I can show from case studies why that would be relevant and I'll, I'll probably get funded for it. Um, at the same time, what I find is that we end up with uh, C-levels tell, or prescribing work to teams based on metrics uh, that, again, are more about tactical than they are about strategic. So when I get yeah. told something like, okay, so what we want you to do is bring us 500 leads a month. I go, right. okay, I can do that for you tomorrow. I can't. Uh, but to, that's, if that's the only thing that determines my bonus, that's great. I'm not going to tell you like whether or not they're any good, I, but I'll get you 500. <laughs> yes. So, you know, it needs to be less about these very tactical, um, again, the what versus the why. What do you actually want here? What are you actually looking for? You're looking for people that you want, you want to make sales to people, right? So how do we look at that? And, um, and it, yeah. it may be a more fluid concept of metrics. It may be a f- more fluid concept of spend. Um, timing, definitely timing is an issue. You know, this concept of quarters, like time is a construct, folks. I can't, I can't <laughs> tell right. you for sure that, you know, a campaign <laughs> that we released two weeks before, this is my favorite too, every department panics at the end of quarter. So they're like, oh, can you please do up a video? Can you please do up a content thing? Like whatever. Uh, and then we produce all this stuff and then the quarter ends and our spend is high because we built a bunch of stuff in the last two weeks of the quarter. <laughs> and then, But all right. of the ROI is coming later. So, you know, it, yeah. exactly. It's, it's, it just repeats itself over and over. Um, uh, I want to switch for a moment and, you know, you've clearly come into this position where you're now like a marketing mensch and you can tell, you know, both big and small companies what they're doing wrong and importantly help them maybe prevent mistakes and get some good marketing going. Take me back, Jordan. Tell me how you got into this and what it uh, began with that allowed you to now speak with authority uh, to people of all different sizes at all different levels on marketing. Well, my route was not the standard route. Uh, My first career was actually as a social service worker. So I went to school the first time around for social services. Okay. now, there's a lot of psychology in that, uh, group dynamics, team dynamics, community uh, dynamics work. That's, that was my focus. Uh, and then when I went into the field, um, I did a ton of work around developing programs. And so that would mean establishing a need with hard to reach populations, uh, many of which we had absolutely no data points on. We'd have to go out and do a ton of uh, crowdsourcing, I guess you call it now. Okay. Uh, then presenting our findings to a funding body and saying, listen, I've got a I've got an idea here that this is a program that's needed in the community, right. uh, creating that program, creating the outreach strategy for it, and then implementing all of that with, by the way, like no money, uh, yeah. and then, um, implementing, the, implementing the program and then doing um, any sort of follow-up evaluation. And, uh, and that meant that we were doing everything from funding proposals to marketing campaigns to um, you know, like you name it, we had to do the whole gamut and we never called anything marketing, of course, uh, because it's like a dirty word, but um, outreach and communications is what we typically called things. And we, I mean, everything from the press releases, there was no support. We, everything's in-house. Um, and so uh, even before I went to school, I had done over 2000 hours of volunteer time with uh, some youth leadership groups through the Youth Services Bureau. And so uh, I had experience from the age of 17, writing press releases, having interviews with press, talking with the mayor, like everything. And uh, so it came very naturally to me. Um, And what I really wanted to do was marketing. uh, But, you know, my path took me in this direction. So about 10 years into that job, I thought, I like, I, I really love the work, but the bureaucracy was killing me. So I thought I need to make a change. I didn't really know how I was going to do that. And then I had sort of an opportunity to just practice. I wasn't thinking long-term crazy plans here, uh, but I got engaged and we had no money. And so I started a blog hoping that my cousins would get excited about my wedding. Uh, no. And maybe, you know, we're Irish Catholics. So I have like 80, at least 85 cousins. I have, I think it's 120 <laughs> second cousins. It's nuts. Uh, <laughs> and they all get married all the time. So I thought, well, they must have things that I can borrow or, or take from their old weddings. And they didn't because people don't keep stuff in their basements, apparently. So uh, I thought, okay, well, I need to make this bigger. So we called it Project Priceless. And the 
created a, a mission. The goal was to create a wedding as free of charge as possible. It could be things that were handmade, handed down. Uh, they could be new, old, didn't matter. Wow. Uh, we just take whatever people gave us. And the plan was to do, all I really wanted was a dress, a cake, and a venue, a venue big enough to hold those cousins. And so, uh, you know, I started a blog, I did some press releases, I, I started on social media, uh, and I was pretty new to a lot of that stuff other than using it for work. Um, and in a very short time, the story caught on and it went viral. So we were covered in media uh, across the planet. I have magazines from the UK that we're in. Oh, wow. um, it just went nuts. Uh, Ottawa went nuts for it too. Um, and in the course of 10 months, so we got a, one, a venue was one of the first things we got. And so we knew we had a 10 month window. We um, had about 80,000 hits on the blog. We had 150 offers of items. 50 of those 150 were from businesses who saw the opportunity to uh, have a mention on the blog. Great. Everything else was from people who made stuff or had stuff from their own weddings. I had a choice of eight dresses. It was huge, crazy. Um, way more than I ever expected. I'm not a wedding girl, so I was really overwhelmed, frankly. I, I did not know what an escort <laughs> card was. I don't know right. what a boot here is. Like, what? Okay. Right. Um, Anyway, it was huge. And so we ended up putting together a wedding that in 2010, so, you know, inflation, but in 2010 was valued at 40 grand and we spent $200. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) It was, no, and this is a really important part. And this is a takeaway for your business people. It was $200 and 40 hours a week of work. So my rule for marketing is if it doesn't cost you money, it will cost you time. (laughs) Yes. Yes. So uh, it became basically a, a full-time job for me. Um, and now, the nice thing is that I'm a writer at heart, so I got to write, which was great. Uh, sure. The wedding was heartfelt. We ended up with guests who were people that we'd met through the project at the wedding. Wow. Uh, like, just really cool. And yeah. it, was a, it was a trial by fire. We, um, you know, we were covered in a certain right-wing newspaper that I won't mention. Um, and their article had a bit of a different tone on the piece. And huh. we And from there, we learned about the importance of comment moderation because we never knew what trolls were before. Right. Uh, We had like the worst kind, like the kind that say really terrible things that people shouldn't say to each other. Um, And we learned all about that. Uh, Yes. You know, we learned a lot of lessons um, and it was, but it was wildly successful and it was big enough that, you know, I remember one time I was at a craft show and I was eating I was, I went hungry. And so I was in the jam section and I was just eating all this jam on crackers because I was hungry and I wasn't really going to buy jam, but you know, you're just like, you hit that point in the craft show. Yeah. Anyway, so you're hoping no one notices that you're eating a lot of jam. And uh, a woman came up to me and she was like, so I don't know which dress you're going to choose. Cause I really like that short one. And I was like, who are you? And then right, right. I realized that point Com- where I complete stranger. Quite, exactly. I can't quietly eat jam in the, in the taste. No, anymore. So no. It was, uh, your anonymity is gone. <laughs> on so that was and that was really important because uh a year and a half later for reasons i never explained publicly but uh we actually ended up divorced and so um i was faced at that time we still had a following the whole time and so i was faced with choice do i quietly go into the night here or do i rebrand and so i ended our blog with just a line saying if you want to continue the story go here and i started my own and it starts off uh the first night i'm on my own at my house and that one was a lot more, uh, that one was a lot more free form. I wasn't going for, I wasn't trying to monetize. I wasn't trying to do anything fancy. With sure. it. I right. And uh, that one turned out to be an amazing experience for me. Some of my writing um, was acclaimed by critics and I got to read at the Writers Festival and, you know, all sorts of great stuff like that. But um, so that was my launch and and that was my testing ground and where I, where I personally went through the fire and that helped me help other people not go through some fires. So through that, we ended up, a lot of those businesses that had donated to the wedding asked for support around, you know, we're just trying to get into social media. How does this work? And so we started um, talking with them and then that turned into me doing a lot more of that. And so, um, and before the wedding project was even done, I had actually been headhunted for a position with uh, useeverywhere.com, which is a precursor to Kijiji. Yes. Uh, And so I worked as the uh, marketing manager for usedottawa.com, the Ottawa branch. Uh, and then my career just spun like crazy from there. Um, and my uh, Danger Co, um, I started about, I think it's nine years ago now, uh, when I decided that, you know, it was great to be embedded long term at companies. And I've done that several times, but I wasn't yes. going to get the breadth of experience that I wanted doing that all the time. So yes. um, I I was committed. And it's my own form of self-education is to stay committed to having um, small 
projects or, you know, medium sized projects with other brands so that I could be practicing stuff that wasn't required by the company I was embedded with. Yeah, that is one of the downsides of being with one company. It is great, but you will, you have to sacrifice the fast velocity of seeing a lot of different situations for the depth of getting into one situation. Exactly. And that's why I really, I had, I spent about two years um, with Invest Ottawa as their marketing advisor, first for uh, brick and mortar style businesses or Main Street, I guess we're calling them now. Uh, yeah. And then um, over time, I, I kind of worked my way into the um, innovation program. So the startups, the, the tech startups and so forth. And uh, so there I, I probably worked with somewhere in the ballpark of 100 businesses um, over my time there from everything from starting at the ground level. We, we need a logo. We don't know what we're doing. How do you even get a yes. product on the shelf to, you know, we're going through major hire or we've got a crisis point. If we don't make money soon, we're done, you know, whatever the, the case was. And so uh, that was that was a ride, man. Like, wow. But. <laughs> Uh, you know, amazing experience um, to get to work with so many different companies at so many different stages at the same time. Yes. Wow. Uh, so I, I honestly did not know that that, that whole thing happened. And <laughs> when you say that, you know, you can show people the path now. Uh, yeah, it's abundantly clear to anybody who's been listening that <laughs> y- you have been on the path. And so that that's where you get that uh conviction in your voice and I can hear it loud and clear. Um, Tell me, Jordan, is there maybe one last tip that you want to leave with us or maybe a place that people who want to reach out to you or uh, see what Danger Co. does, where can they go? Well, yeah, absolutely. Come and check out my site, dangerco.co. Um, you know, I've got a blog up there if you want to get a feel for my style and my candor. I'm, I'm kind of known for my candor, so be ready for that. Um, and uh, LinkedIn is my favorite place to actually communicate with people on a business level. So, I mean, if you just want to see pictures of my dog, then we can, you know, meet up on Instagram. <laughs> I'm dog obsessed, but uh, you're certainly welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. And uh, I mean, really, to marketers, my last piece of advice would be study outside your field, participate in teams outside of your department, focus on psychology, economics, and consumer behavior, listen, all the time, listen. And follow what your audiences follow and watch it like you're Spock on an away mission. Like, don't get into it. Don't get emotional. Watch it like you're a science officer from Star Trek. And if you don't know what that means, go watch Star Trek. That's really important. That's probably the most important advice I could give you today. And, uh, you know, in terms of uh, overall advice for companies, for marketers, for companies as well, take a 360 approach to marketing. We should be involved in every department. I, when I start um, as a consultant or as an embedded um, marketer at any company, I explain right away, my plan is for marketing to be the general store here. What you need is probably on our shelves. So every department should have a way that they're served or bettered or improved by marketing. And that's how marketing improves. We improve when other departments improve. So there's no reason for us to ever feel like we're a silo apart from others. Amen. Um, I, I can't help but laugh with uh, that list is beautiful. And the Star Trek reference just took it over the edge because I kid you not, I've got my show notes in front of me and the image that I put, and now it's just got to be the uh, cover image for this podcast is Jean-Luc Picard doing a face palm. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> right. So we, we've come full circle here, but yeah, these, uh, just talking about, uh, you know, ups and downs and, you know, it seems that there's a whole lot that, uh, happens in marketing that mirrors what happens in life. And I guess that's maybe where we end, you know, just embracing it and just saying, okay, this is how it rolls and you gotta be okay with it. You know, don't do it again. I love some of your advice and, uh, I don't know how else to end with maybe except a live long and prosper, Jordan. <laughs> live long and prosper. Indeed. I love it. <laughs> All right. uh, so listen, for anybody who's still listening to us, I want to thank you so much for catching us to the end. And if you like what you've heard today, please go ahead, you know, comment back. Uh, I'm also on LinkedIn. We've got Twitter and we're on funnel reboot or I'm at Hey Glenn S. You're welcome to go ahead and reach out. And if you really like what you've heard, I'd encourage you to hit the subscribe button on your phone so that you can get future episodes so thank you once again for joining and we'll talk again soon thanks for listening follow the show on twitter at funnel reboot if you like what you have heard today please consider leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts